book, The American Covenant. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that, uh, that throughout history you've sent revival to your people. That revival is the bringing back to life of dead things. Lord, uh, in many ways it could be said of us in America that we have flatlined when it comes to our, our spiritual fervency and our, uh, our spiritual life. Lord, we've, we've made a show out of religion. We've made a business out of praying and building big churches and putting on concerts and selling books. And dear God, we, 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 we thank you for our blessings, but Lord, we, we, we sense that we need some kind of a radical change in our hearts and we need to be about the real thing. We sense, Lord, that we've gone astray and we need you to bring us back onto the right road, the high road that leads to blessing and hope and a future for our children. Oh God, don't let liberty die on our watch. Wake us up, shake us up. Give us strength to stand up. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, <clears throat> it's uh, my pleasure to be with you again this evening. And we've been looking through... Uh, this book right here called The American Covenant, The Untold Story. And this is a book written by Dr. Marshall Foster. We're going to be getting the updated version to you soon so that you can uh, read through it yourself. It's been a treasure for me. It's going to be a family heirloom for my kids. And I've got my notes just all through this, this entire thing. I don't even think you could read my version of it anymore. Uh, but <clears throat> I was reading through a lesson for today. And it's, it's, it's absolutely inspiring. I, I, I absolutely love this. And... Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Foster, Dr. Foster was, uh, was telling me as I was talking to him on the phone and um, he's writing here in his book that revival always comes at a time where the people seem to think that all hope is lost. Revival comes on the back of moral failure. It comes on the back of political failure. It comes on the back of spiritual failure when people finally realize that they've come to the end of themselves and all of their smarts and all of their guns and all of their, 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 their religion can't get them to a place of life and liberty. In fact, they're creating their own prisons for themselves with all of their conniving and all of their manipulating and all of their attempts to control. It's when they finally realize that the heart of man is, is sick and is in desperate need of God's healing, that they cry out to the great physician and he sends, he sends revival. He sends the rain on parched souls and parched hearts. And uh, Dr. Foster says here that it's at the times that are the worst when communism is coming, when the pandemic is at its worst, when the disease is ravaging people and the economy is in the toilet, that's when God historically raises up revival. It's when he, that's when he raises up an army of compassion who can see beyond the cultural moment, beyond the media moment. And that's what we are, are mesmerized by right now. We're, 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 we're paralyzed by these, these media moments and the media is just in our face all of the time telling us what's important, what to think about, what, what to be concerned about and what we need to do. And you know what? That's not the way the world works. That's the way the media would like to th to us to think that the world works, that what they say is what's actually important and that's what should consume our thoughts and that they are the only ones that have the solution. That's not the way the world works. Tyrants want us to think that that's the way the world works. But the answer has always been the covenants, the covenants of God, the, those sacred promises made between God and the family of faith. God's ways win every time. Covenant keepers win and covenant breakers lose. We're in the midst, in the middle of a giant story. It's his story. 
That's why they call it history. And those who keep covenant with God, their promises to love and obey him and to care for one another and to apply God's word to all spheres of, of, of our world, of our culture, our home, our family, our schools, our churches, our government, we are on the winning side. God's ways win historically. And I'm gonna give you an example of that. When we fight God's way personally, defeating sin in our heart, healing our marriages in our homes, strong churches, defending freedom in the word of God, and then moving into positions of leadership in the government, it works. It provides blessing every time, historically. You say, Kirk, are you, are you serious? I mean, give me an example of when that has happened in the world, but in a situation like we're in right now here in America. In fact, I'll give you an example right here in America. As you know, that the uh, colonists came over from England and uh, we talked about the pilgrims in the 16, 19, 16, 20, uh, 1621 time zone. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this from Dr. Foster. We had a period of time in the 1700s called the Great Awakening. I would call it the Great Revival. It was when, when people were, they had fallen asleep and, and, and they, were, they were asleep, they were unaware, they were unconcerned and uninvolved in, in, the, in the business that they were supposed to be about. They had fallen away in England and in America from the biblical faith that they had been taught. They were, they were getting lazy, they were getting into materialism, they were getting into themselves rather than continuing in loving God and caring for one another. And in England, they were all, they were, they were all about their materialism in the, in the early 1700s and they were all about building this worldwide empire. They were the, they were the superpower of the world. And in America, um, the, the, the descendants of the pilgrims had, had lost their way and they had gotten away from the simple love for God and the simple faith that they had been taught by their pilgrim grandparents. And they were moving out west because there was this real estate boom and, they, and there was this cheap land out there and they were all about that opportunity. And they lost sight of the covenants, the sacred promises with God. And then after that, things went from bad to worse when suddenly a great depression came about and it destroyed the economy. And uh, England and America were, 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 were collapsing this real estate bubble had been destroyed. They were in despair and then something amazing happened. When things seemed like they couldn't have gotten worse morally and economically and politically, it was bad. It was really bad. God did something. He revived and converted certain individuals and brought them into the family of faith. And they were all in. They were full-hearted followers of God and of his word in the Bible. And just three of these, of these brothers of ours from history, I'm going to focus on three of them, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, and George Whitfield. These three men God used to do amazing things. John Wesley in England. He began to preach and preach the gospel and he began to teach the word of God and saw a conversion of the people of England. And because of the revival that broke out in the hearts of the people and the families and the churches and the culture of England, that led to the end of the slave trade. And it also gave birth to the worldwide missionary movement of the 19th century with the gospel being sent out through missionaries to all of the world because of the revival that happened in the heart of John Wesley. And then you have in America, you have uh, a man named George Whitfield who came over from England and he went to Georgia and he began starting to establish orphanages. He was taking care of the poor because, and, and the orphans because, and the widows because he had read God's word that true religion is about taking care of widows and orphans in their time of need. And he began to preach to so many people that, the, that they couldn't hold the people inside of the churches. So he preached to groups as large as 20,000 people on the tops of hilltops, a mountaintops, because they couldn't fit them inside of the buildings. And he saw uh, a half of the South and a third of New England converted and brought into the family of faith with a love for God and a, re a revived love for one another through his preaching. And then you've got Jonathan Edwards. 
Jonathan Edwards, the famous preacher, who would just, he brought about just a trembling in the hearts of, of people and criminals and, and, and others who were far away from God began dropping their weapons and coming to him. Jonathan Edwards, they said, uh, has been said that he was the finest intellect ever produced on American soil. This is the result of God sending revival, personal revival into the hearts of people that translates into family and church and national revival. And what was the result of it? What was the result of, of this, this, this revival that started small in the hearts of these three men? This is amazing. Um, and the result was that the, they called it the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening was the defining and central cultural movement in the 18th century. And it's what gave our founders the character that they needed, the courage that they needed. These are the George Washingtons, the Madisons, these are the, the Adams. It gave our founders the courage and the biblical knowledge that they needed in order to not only understand their freedoms that were given to them by God, but have the courage to defend those freedoms from the tyrants who wanted to take them away. And John Adams, our second president, he was asked what the real American Revolution was. And you may say, well, that's an obvious answer. I mean, the American Revolution, that was the war against the British. Americans against the British, the War of Independence. John Adams, the second president of the United States, said, no, no, that, wa that was not the revolution. He said, and I quote, uh, before I quote, Dr. Foster says, the war came after the revolution after the revolution that had already taken place in the hearts of the people. Now, here's the quote from John Adams. Second president of the United States says this, what do we mean by the American revolution? Do we mean the war? He says, no, that was no part of the revolution. It was only an effect and consequence of it. The revolution was in the minds of the people, a change in their religious sentiments their religious beliefs, their religious convictions. In other words, the founders, he said, were convicted of what was right and were then willing to die defending what was right rather than compromise and let elites destroy their nation and their children. Did you hear that? The real revolution was not the war. John Adams said it was the revolution that took place in their hearts and in their minds. They had read the word of God. They were set free and they were set on fire with a, with a sacred love for God and for the freedoms that God had given them and to care for one another. And they had the courage then to be willing to rat, risk and sacrifice their lives to defend these freedoms that were, that, were, that the tyrants were trying to, to strip, strip from them. And here's the chilling words from Dr. Foster. He says, America, and I believe this with all my heart, America today cannot be won by riots in the streets or war. Let me say that again. America cannot be won by riots in the streets or war. America will be won or lost in the living rooms of our families and the pulpits of our churches. I don't think you'll hear a more profound truth maybe for the rest of our lives. America will be won or lost in the living rooms of our families and the pulpits of our churches. That means mom, dad, you have the most powerful role in the country. It is not the president. It is not Congress. It is not the lawyers and the lobbyists, and it is not big techs and the bankers. The most powerful role in the country is the role of mom, the role of dad. And the second most powerful role is what you have, pastor, minister, reverend. I believe our country will be won or lost by what you and I do as we lead in our homes, in the living rooms, and in our churches. God help us if we don't preach the word of God, 
and live out the word of God, especially in the tough places like our homes and locally in our communities with our neighbors. But if we do that, there is great hope. If we and our children are revived, if we are saved by the tens of millions, then we will rise up and we will be the salt and light that can transform our nation from within. Right? Doesn't that make sense? If we can do that by the millions, and we've got 20,000 here with us right now, more will be listening tonight, more will be listening tomorrow. If we can spread this message, this is what it's all about. If we can get more and more people whose hearts get caught on fire with the message of liberty and freedom that comes from God and is sustained by a faith in God, then we can transform our nation from within, from our living rooms and from our our houses of worship. But if we are not revived, if we stay lazy and asleep, unaware, unconcerned, uninvolved, and dead, flatlining when it comes to God and wanting to heavenize this world, if we don't take up our role as the defenders of God's freedom, then whatever war is waged will be lost before it has even begun. If we don't take up our role as leaders and defenders of God's freedom, then whatever war we try to wage politically, with words, with money, with weapons, it will be lost before it begins. This is the way God made his world. This is the way that it works. We win from the inside out. Victory is secured from the bottom up. It's not from the top and the elites down. They'll try to do that. That's called manipulation and control. But real liberty and real security and real strength and the key to, to transformation of our world is starting in the heart and it works its way out. And it starts at the grassroots, we the people, and it works its way up. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we ask you to continue to send revival. Send revival into our homes and our hearts. God, make us like George Whitfield. Let us see our dead congregations come to life like those old dry bones. Lord, make them, make them rattle. Let us, let us hear them clap their hands and raise their voices to heaven. Dear God, make us like John Wesley who sees injustice and preaches the gospel and, 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 and let our words inspire others to end other evils like William Wilberforce did in ending the slave trade in England. And God, make us like Jonathan Edwards. Give us intellect, give us ability to reason and show us, Lord, how to, to use our minds for good and not for evil. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, my pleasure to be with you tonight and, and to pray with you. I'm going to read through your comments. Uh, please continue to let other people know about the Campfire Revival. God bless you. Uh, my mom's doing great. Thank you for your prayers. Some of you are still asking. She's feeling great. Uh, I believe that God has uh, just uh, been very, very gracious and kind to her, and she's, she's feeling really, really good. Uh, I'm continuing to pray for you. Remember that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, a healthy mind. Remember that. He loves you and nothing comes to you uh, without passing through his loving and, uh, and, and caring hands. See you tomorrow night.